Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Today we have the best of East and West. It is a shootout between all-arounders in stainless steel from two of the great watchmaking brands in the business. It's Grand Seiko versus Omega versus Starts Now. Let's start with the senior most of our pair. And that is the Grand Seiko Heritage Collection Spring Drive Automatic SBGA 407, better known by its nickname, the Skyflake. This came out in 2019, and the watch takes the popular snowflake motif from the SBGA 211, and it changes the case shape for a more vintage-inspired look, transitions from a bracelet to a strap, and of course, and most importantly, imparts this lovely sky blue color to the snowflake dial. Speaking of dimensions, the stainless steel watch is 40.2 millimeters in diameter. In terms of thickness, it is 13.3 millimeters, and it is 48.2 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip with a 19 millimeter spacing between the lugs. We'll throw the watch on my wrist, which is 16 centimeters in circumference, and you can see that it has a vintage look. The conceit of the Heritage Collection at Grand Seiko is that the design from the heavily domed plexiglass-like crystal to the minimalist case with its long tapered lugs. It's designed to evoke the original 1960 Grand Seiko, the 3180, the first of the Grand Seikos. So this is a this is a heritage piece that is very modern in construction, but traditional in its aesthetic. It's low enough to fit underneath the cuff. There's going to be no issue with that, and it fits well on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist. I think if you're going to wear one of these as a dress timepiece or with formal attire, this is going to be the better match. Taking a quick look at the strap, it is of exceptionally high grade. There's a magic to Grand Seiko straps, even when they're made of relatively stiff materials like alligator leather, and this is a strap that's brand new. It's never been broken in. It is still wonderfully supple and buttery. I don't know how they achieve that. It must be the tanning process, but you never get this from Swiss-made straps or from European-sourced straps on Swiss watches. So we have a navy blue semi-gloss, large rectangular scale alligator leather with a folded edge, a monotone stitch on the bottom calfskin, again, very buttery. It is a brand new Grand Seiko strap and it is in outstanding condition. Here we have a deployant clasp and you can see the vintage theme is carried all the way to the vintage Grand Seiko logo on the buckle. You can see one of the strap minders is made of metal. It is a twin trigger, single fold deployant clasp. So this watch does feature a little bit of security on the wrist. That type of clasp is ideal if you're going to use the watch for an active lifestyle. And of course, this watch is 100 meters water resistant, steel and automatic. So don't discount its sports watch credentials. The timepiece does feature that vintage inspired case that I told you about, and it is hand finished. The artisan who creates this case holds the surface to be milled directly against a spinning tin plate. The machine, called a Zalitz machine, is made in Europe, but the foremost practitioners of this flawless mirror finish, which they call Zaratsu, are the folks in Japan at Seiko and Grand Seiko. You will not find an entirely hand-finished case in a Swiss watch of this price. And remember, this is a technique that takes about three years for the artisan to master. So we're not talking about a casual polishing. This is a craft art and a handmade watch. Now the crown, as you can see, is a, a push down crown. The watch does have 100 meter water resistance. Take a quick look. There's a little kerf in the case back where you can dig your nail in to more easily withdraw the crown for setting. The dial is as handcrafted as the case itself. Now the dial base features a sort of rough windblown snowfall. The kind of texture that you could see outside of the Grand Seiko Nagano Prefecture Studios that make these spring drive movements. So it is just like windblown snow drifts, but the blue element is added to give it a little bit of a sky tone and add some color and warmth that's otherwise missing in the standard snowflake. It takes eight primary steps and up to 80 individual technical steps to create this dial. So there, there are eight different I would call them milestones along the way to creating this dial, but there are 80 
very technical, very specific individual operations involved in achieving those eight primary steps. So this is a very handcrafted dial base. It involves stamping, it involves varnishing, and it involves multiple layers of the coatings. The indices, the hands, the logo, and the frame for the date, they are also handcrafted. They are cut on diamond-tipped micrometric milling tools by artisans who do this all day, and they're very specialized artisans. All they do is create these little glittering man-made gems. The indices are then placed along with the logo and the date frame on the dial manually by artisans who use acrylic tweezers and do all of the work by eye. Now, the seconds hand sweeps in a continuous arc. This is spring drive. There are no stops, no staggers, no beats, no ticks, no tocks. It's a unique aesthetic, and the hand itself is fire-blued steel. You can see that the Dauphine-style minute and hour hands are exquisitely mirror-polished and faceted. Very impressive. Inside, we have spring drive caliber 9R65. You can see it's water-resistant down to 100 bar. I do not lie. 72-hour power reserve. We have both a hacking seconds function and a quick set date, so you can rapidly cycle the date. There's a power reserve indicator for that three-day power reserve. Automatic winding, it pivots on 30 joules. It is watchmaker assembled, watchmaker regulated, and when the time comes, watchmaker serviced. It is a lifetime movement, not just for the lifetime of the owner, but for the potential lifetime of the timepiece. There's a unidirectional governing wheel. This watch turned entirely by spring energy. No capacitors, no batteries, no stepper motors. The hands are driven by the spring, and so is this governing wheel. The governing wheel turns, creates induced electric current, which is transferred to a quartz oscillator. That wakes up, and via a electromagnetic braking force, it slows down the governing wheel to govern the accuracy of the watch, and the accuracy is plus or minus 15 seconds per month. All very impressive stuff, and this technology really is exclusive to Seiko and Grand Seiko. Piaget has dabbled in it, but barely ever brought it to market. It remains a signature of this brand. And remember, at Seiko and Grand Seiko, everything's made in-house, right down to the shock protection and even the lubricants inside the watch. Fully integrated, vertical manufacture, price new, $5,800, pre-owned, $4,500 to $5,500, but there is a caveat there. If you want to get it at the lower end of that scale, $4,600, you really have to buy from a Japanese domestic market vendor. In the West, you'll find these between five and five and a half thousand dollars used, which is not all that much less than the $5,800 new price. Okay, Omega. A newer watch, the Aquaterra small second debuted in 2021, and it's based on the 2017 to present redesign of the Aquaterra collection. There are several different case sizes, but this one in steel is 41 millimeters. Seamaster Aquaterra small second in the larger size. 41 in diameter, 13.5 millimeters thickened from lug tip to lug tip, 47.5 millimeters with a 20 millimeter spacing between the lugs. The strap, as you can see, is a molded piece in a lovely sort of slate blue, somewhere between gray and blue. It's quite attractive, although it doesn't actually have two bound layers. It does have a contrasting stitch, and you can see that there is a little end piece that's inserted to create a more integrated junction of strap and case. Uh, this is something the decidedly more vintage aesthetic of the Grand Seiko foregoes. And then we have a buckle which uses twin triggers for release, same as the Grand Seiko, and features a single fold, same as the Grand Seiko, but unlike the Grand Seiko, which uses minder loops to take care of extra length, uh, this strap actually tucks into the minder, tucks under the minder, and then all the excess length is hidden underneath the strap. So you don't have any need for minder loops, and you can't see the excess length externally. It is a very clean solution. This clasp is long serving at Omega. It's almost 20 years old at this point. Why change what works? The case will be familiar to Speedmaster and Seamaster fans. We first saw it in the early 60s. It is the liar style lug, so it's beveled inward, and then there are also bevels that bevel outward. We have satin finish on the mid case longitudinal. The outward bevels are polished. We have a conical polished bezel, and then we have a inverse conical crown. It's a combination of polish and media blasting, and we have a dial with a lovely metallic teak deck concept pattern, blue slate, 
again, it is sort of that slate blue with a metallic tinge. It's not a sunburst. It's more of a frosted or opaline style metallic. We have hands that are beautifully double finished with satin and polished, and the same is true of all the applique indices. These aren't as excruciatingly handcrafted as what you find on the Grand Seiko, but they are attractive. And unlike the Grand Seiko, the Omega does include plenty of loom. Even the small seconds has loom. So you can use this watch in some conditions where the Grand Seiko may be a little bit out of its depth. And speaking of which, this is 150 meters water resistant to this one's 100, so small advantage Omega. The two-tone dial coloration is attractive, as are the several different focal planes of the dial. The timepiece does feature a number of subsidiary setting modes. Well, it doesn't feature a power reserve indicator like the spring drive movement does. It does feature a function that allows you to move the hour hand independently. So note that I haven't stopped the seconds. I'm not disrupting the minute hand. And if I wish, I can actually change the date forward or backwards as I travel east or west. We have an applied Omega logo. And although the watch case and dial are not as lavishly handcrafted as on the Grand Seiko. They are attractive, and you do have options. There are other case sizes, other case materials, other strap options, other dial colors. You can even decide whether you want a strap or a bracelet within the Aquaterra Small Seconds collection, so versatility is on its side. Now, in terms of price, this watch, new, costs $6,050. Pre-owned, it's going to be between five and five and a half thousand dollars. Turn the watch over. We have caliber 8916. And you can see this is basically the 8900 with a small seconds complication added. That means we have twin mainspring barrels. That means we have a 60 hour power reserve. For durability against shock, we have a full balance bridge and a free sprung index. And for resistance to magnetism, this watch is effectively a magnetic. You get a silicon hairspring and an anti-magnetic escapement. And really this is gonna be a much, much less magnetically susceptible watch than this. This is about 4,800 ampere per meter. This is anti-magnetic to over 15,000 gauss. And remember, 1,000 gauss is about 80,000 ampere per meter. So with the twin barrels, you've got less of an amplitude drop off than on a single barrel movement. But again, this watch doesn't need amplitude to keep good time. So this is a master chronometer, which means it meets the COSC standards, not just as a bare movement, but as a fully cased up movement and tested in six positions, not just five. But at the end of the day, even if this watch runs to about one second Second per day, it's probably not going to keep time to within 15 seconds a month like the Grand Seiko. So this watch does go above and beyond the COSC bare minimum. It's just up against an impossible opponent with a quartz oscillator. This would be a Olympian for mechanical time telling competitions. It's just a little bit out of its league against spring drive. Now there are other features here that I do like. And we should probably go over some of the advantages of this watch. So zoom out a little bit. This watch includes loom. The Grand Seiko doesn't. This watch is 150 meters to the Grand Seiko's 100. This watch features the time zone function for the hour hand. This watch is far more resistant to magnetism, and that makes a big deal for a lot of folks. Even if you just have super powerful magnets in your laptop, you may be surprised at how susceptible your conventional watch is. Now, also important to note, with many different strap options and dial options, case metals, bracelets, different sizes, this is a much more customizable watch, and this watch comes standard with a water-resistant strap, whereas you have to buy another strap if you want to swim with the Skyflake. So those are the advantages there. All of them are considerable, and I should mention Grand Seiko has evened the score. They both have five-year warranties now, so the Omega no longer has that particular advantage. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Skyflake. So, this watch has unique technology. It has spring drive, which is both intellectually fascinating and graceful in practice. It's interesting to look at, and the fact is it took from 1977 to 2005 and many patents and many setbacks to bring automatic winding spring drive to market. So, this is a technical tour de force even today. Day. And it's basically an exclusive for Seiko and Grand Seiko, so you will not see it elsewhere. Accuracy is a big deal. Extra power reserve. This is 72 hours versus the Aquaterra's 60. Also, the Indicateur Reserve de Manche. I'm sure there's a different name for it in Japanese, but it is an extra feature, making this watch a genuine complication. It is handcrafted. The case is hand finished. The dial is handmade. The indices, hands, the frame for the date, the logo are excruciatingly handcrafted and played 
placed by hand. So this watch has an appeal that you typically find on Swiss watches costing four, five times more, or even more than that compared to the Grand Seiko. Pricing by a small margin. This watch costs $250 less when it's new, and typically you should be able to find it for about $500 less when it's used than the Omega. The timepiece also is far scarcer. Grand Seiko makes somewhere between 35,000 and 50,000 watches a year with a lot of segmentation and different variants and different models. So the number of Skyflakes each year is vanishingly small, whereas Omega is making over half a million watches a year and the Aquaterra is one of its best sellers. So which of these two do I prefer for my wrist? Well, I'm gonna go with the Grand Seiko. First of all, all the hand craftsmanship, that means a lot to me. This watch almost qualifies as haute horlogerie because I've always defined the difference between the haute de gamme and mere luxury horology as being the involvement of human artisans, and you definitely have that here. The technology, spring drive, from the extra power reserve to the accuracy to the grace of the gliding seconds hand, I really like that. And then there are the intangibles. It just feels more special. It looks more special. The closer you get to this dial, the more impressive it becomes. The closer you get to this dial, the bigger it looks. That's really all I can say about the Omega. So this is a watch that, to me, has the intangibles of a high-end independent piece or an article of haute horlogerie. The fact that it's a little bit more affordable and wears better on my wrist is the icing on the cake. You guys let me know which of these two Olympians from Switzerland and Japan do you prefer? If price is an object, if price is no object, let me know. Which one would you pick? Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.